Hello viewers, in today's lecture, I will be discussing about the topic mechanism of parturition and its hormonal regulation. Before I begin, I would like to mention that this video is a part of the online lecture series initiated by the Zoological Society of Assam to help the students pursuing their graduation in zoology. Therefore, let us begin our lecture. Learning Outcomes by the end of this lecture session, I believe that my viewers will get an overview on the basic concept of parturition, the difference between primate and non-primate mammalian parturition, the role of hypothalamus, pituitary and placental hormones in parturition. We will also discuss the stages and mechanism of parturition and its feedback regulation along with the interactions between the immune system and the process of parturition. Historical background Here I will be talking about some of the interesting facts about pregnancy and childbirth. Pregnancy tests have been around for a very long time. The first urine based pregnancy test was recorded in ancient Egypt more than 3000 years ago. In 1853 Chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria used this anesthetic for the first time during her eighth delivery. In 1942, Dr. Grantley Dick Reed proclaimed the benefits of natural childbirth without the use of anesthesia or tools. In the early 20th century, Austrian and German physicians, followed by the American physicians a few years later, began experimenting with a combination of scopolamine and morphine in childbirth. A 25-year-old lady, Mrs. Hunter, had been pregnant for 375 days instead of the normal 270 days and it is said to be the longest pregnancy till record. In 1914, McClure's magazine published Painless Childbirth in which Two laywomen raved about German doctors Karl Gauss and Bernhard Kronig's Twilight Sleep Protocol in which the drugs caused women in labor to enter a state of sleep prior to giving birth and awake from childbirth with no recollection of the procedure. Definition of Parturation Here I will be discussing about the basic concept of parturation. Parturation comes from the Latin word parture, meaning to be in labor or to produce. Parturation or childbirth is the process of delivering the fully grown fetus on the completion of the normal pregnancy period. Towards the end of pregnancy, the uterus becomes progressively more excitable until it develops strong rhythmic contractions until the baby is expelled. Parturation is induced by a complex neuroendocrine mechanism which is triggered by the fully formed fetus and the placenta. Many animals like the large mammals, primates, cattle, horses, giraffe, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, elephants, seals, whales, dolphins and porpoises they are generally pregnant with one offspring at a time, although they may have twin or multiple births on occasion. In this large animals, the birth process is similar to that of a human, although in most cases the offspring is precocial, which means that they are capable of a high degree of independent activity from birth. In the cases of whales and dolphins, the single calf is born tail first, which minimizes the risk of drowning and the mother encourages the newborn to rise to the surface of the water to breathe. Most smaller mammals have multiple birds, producing a large number of young. Here, each fetus is surrounded by its own amniotic sac and has a separate placenta. This separates from the wall of the uterus during labor and fetus works its way towards the birth canal. So now, let us see the signs of parturition in human which includes bloody vaginal discharge, filling 
relentlessness, relaxed pelvic ligaments, bloated abdomen, fully swollen vulva, breakage of the water bag, and strong contractions along with lower back pain and cramping. So here we can see the signs of parturition in cattle also known as calving. We will know that the cow is about to give birth when we can see that the belly has increased in size, there is sinking of the tail base, the water bag appears through the vulva and the cow will be extra vocal and will strain more. There will be release of mucus and the breakage of water bag along with differences in behavior and the shape of the cow's belly may change as the calf moves back. Here we will be discussing about the role of placenta. The placenta is a temporary organ that connects the developing fetus via the umbilical cord to the uterine wall to allow nutrient uptake, thermoregulation, waste elimination and gas exchange via the mother's blood supply to fight against internal infection and to produce hormones which support pregnancy. Placentas are a defining characteristics of the placental mammals but are also found in marsupials and some non-mammals with varying levels of development. Here in this figure we can see the attachment of placenta with the maternal tissue in different animals. The different types of attachment of the placenta in the maternal tissue such as in superficial, eccentric and interstitial is based on two important characteristics. First, the gross shape of the placenta and the distribution of the contact sites between the fetal membranes and the endometrium. And second, the number of layers of tissues between the maternal and the fetal vascular systems. Here, we will be discussing about the detachment of placenta. The placentas of all eutherian mammals provide common structural and functional features but there are striking difference among species in gross and microscopic structure of the placenta. In most mammalian species the mother bites through the cord and consumes the placenta primarily for the benefit of prostaglandin on the uterus after birth. This is known as placentophagy. However, it has been observed that chimpanzees apply themselves to nurturing their offspring and they keep the fetus cord and placenta intact until the cord dries and detaches the next day. The placenta exists in most mammals and some reptiles. It is probably polyphyletic having arisen separately in evolution rather than being inherited from one distant common ancestor. Studies on pigs indicates that the duration of placenta expulsion increases significantly with the increased duration of furrowing, which is the process of giving birth to piglets. In human, as the fetal hypothalamus matures, the activation of the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis initiates labor through two hormonal mechanisms. The end pathway of both mechanisms leads to myometrial contractions, a mechanical cause of the placental separation. From the shear force, contractile and involution changes in the uterus distorting the placentome. Difference between primate and non-primate mammalian parturition. From a practical viewpoint, there are many obstacles to the study of human parturition. Some fetal tissues such as the umbilical cord, amnion and chorionic membranes and placentas are relatively easy to obtain post-delivery. On the other hand, maternal tissues are much more difficult. Therefore, the use of animal models has provided significant insight into the mechanism regulating parturition at term and preterm. Perhaps the longest established animal model for birth is studied in sheep. The study of parturition in sheep is particularly relevant to human birth as because the gestation length and the number of offspring per gestation 
is closer to that of the humans than most of the common models in use and a shift in the site of progesterone production from the corpus luteum of the ovary to the placenta occurs during pregnancy in both women and ewes. In this figure, we can get a clear picture on the level of progesterone in blood for human and non-human primates such as mare, ewe and cow during different periods of pregnancy. Stages of labor in human A full-term pregnancy lasts approximately 270 days or 38.5 weeks from conception to birth. The events of labor can be divided into three stages. The first stage includes cervical effacement or cervical ripening that is the thinning of the cervix and cervical dilation or the opening of the cervix. The second stage includes the expulsion of the newborn fetus and the third stage includes the afterbirth. We will now be discussing about the different stages of labor in details. The first stage is cervical dilation. For vaginal birth to occur, the cervix must dilate fully to 10 cm in diameter wide enough to deliver the newborn's head first. The dilation stage is said to be the longest stage of labor and it typically takes about 6 to 12 hours. However, it varies widely and may take minutes, hours or days depending on whether the mother has given birth before. In each subsequent labor, this stage tends to be shorter. The dilation stage starts with a series of involuntary contractions of the muscular walls of the uterus, known as uterine contractions or myometrial contractions, and gradual dilation and effacement of the cervix, which is also known as cervical ripening. In this figure, we can see the stage of early cervical dilation from an undilated cervix to a fully dilated stage. The second stage of labor includes the expulsion stage. The expulsion stage begins when the fetal head enters the birth canal and ends with the birth of the newborn. It typically takes up to two hours but it can last longer or be completed in minutes depending on the orientation of the fetus. Once the head is birthed, the rest of the body usually follows quickly. The umbilical cord is then double clamped and a cut is made between the clamps. This completes the second stage of childbirth. The third stage is known as afterbirth. The delivery of the placenta and the associated membranes commonly referred to as the afterbirth marks the final stage of childbirth. After expulsion of the newborn, the myometrium continues to contract. This movement shears the placenta from the back of the uterine wall. It is then easily delivered through the vagina. Here we can clearly see the different stages of labor showing full dilation to the expulsion of the newborn. Here we will be discussing about the mechanism of parturition in cattle. A cow goes through three stages of labor during normal delivery of a calf. The stage 1 includes the cervical dilation stage. This phase begins some 2 to 24 hours before the completion of parturition. There will be hormonal changes which will cause the soft tissues of the birth canal to relax. By the end of stage 1, there may be some behavioral changes such as the elevation of the tail. There will be switching of the tail and increased mucus discharge from the cow. There will be relaxation or softening of the pelvic ligaments. This figure basically demonstrates the stage 1 of parturition in cattle. We can see here that the cervix is not dilated and remains closed at the beginning of stage 1 of parturition. The stage 2 includes the fetal expulsion stage. The cow will usually lie down on her side 
to push and the calf progresses through the birth canal. It begins with the entrance of the membranes and the fetus into the pelvic canal and ends with a completed birth of the calf. The complete delivery of the calf signifies the end of stage 2. The cow scrambles to her feet and turns around and starts vigorously licking the calf. This stage lasts approximately 60 minutes for heifers and 30 minutes for adult cows. Heifers are immature female cows that has not produced any offspring before. The stage 3 includes the placental expulsion or afterbirth. This phase is characterized by the delivery of placenta or the fetal membranes which is usually expelled within a few hours and is often eaten by the normal herbivorous cow. In cattle, this phase normally occurs in less than 8 to 12 hours. Here we can see in figure A the expulsion of the fetal membranes and in figure B we can see that the cow eats her placenta so that the smell does not attract predators towards her and her very vulnerable calf. Here we are going to discuss about the physiology of parturition. Parturition is induced by a complex neuroendocrine mechanism which is triggered by fully formed fetus and the placenta called the fetal ejection reflex. In this figure, we can see the neuroendocrine control of parturition which we have discussed already in the previous slide. During stage 2 of parturition, the fetus engages the cervix. This initiates a neuroendocrine reflex called the Ferguson reflex, an example of a positive feedback mechanism which occurs when the stretch receptors in the cervix are stimulated. The sensory nerve endings in the cervix are stimulated, causing nerve impulses to be sent to the hypothalamus. The neuroendocrine cells of the paraventricular and the supraoptic nuclei depolarize and oxytocin is secreted from the pars nervosa. Oxytocin enters the blood circulation and acts on the oxytocin receptors in the myometrium. This increases the uterine contractions in strength and frequency as a result of oxytocin release. Oxytocin concentrations continue to rise, exhibiting positive feedback until the fetus is expelled thereby the cervical stimulation ceases. This figure demonstrates the endocrinological factors that are involved in the initiation of parturition. The fine balance between the effects of estrogen and progesterone is critical during the onset of labor. Other important hormonal factors are also important in modulating this balance as shown in the diagram. We will now be discussing about the hormonal regulation of parturition. The major hormones involved in the onset and maintenance of human parturition are estrogen, progesterone, prostaglandins, beta-8-CG or human chorionic gonadotrophin, oxytocin, relaxin, cortisol and beta-endorphin. We will now briefly discuss about these hormones one by one. Relaxin, which is secreted by the placenta. Towards the end of pregnancy, relaxin promotes rupture of the membranes surrounding the fetus and the growth, opening and softening of the cervix and vagina to aid the process of childbirth. It also causes softening of the connective tissue in the cervix and promotes elasticity of the pelvic ligaments, thus preparing the birth canal so that the passage of the fetus can occur with ease. Another important hormone of utmost importance is estrogen. Estrogen stimulates the synthesis of enzymes involved in prostaglandin synthesis, that is phospholipase A2. Before labor, 
Prostaglandin stimulates cervical ripening and the breakdown of cervical connective tissue allowing it to become soft and flexible and capable of dilation. During labor, prostaglandin stimulates myometrial contractions. As the time of delivery approaches, estrogen from the ovaries and placenta increases responsiveness to oxytocin by increasing the expression of oxytocin receptors. Another important hormone is oxytocin. Oxytocin is a peptide hormone synthesized in the hypothalamus and released from the posterior pituitary in a pulsatile fashion. The frequency and amplitude of oxytocin induced uterine contractions are identical to those occurring during spontaneous labor. In the following diagram, we can see that oxytocin facilitates and stimulates myometrial contractions. The effects of oxytocin are basically mediated by tissue-specific oxytocin receptor expression, which leads directly to the contractions of myometrium. Progesterone is another important hormone which is produced throughout pregnancy and it results in the relaxation of smooth muscles which inhibits uterine contractions during pregnancy. This is important as we do not want the uterus to contract during pregnancy as the baby is not ready to leave the womb yet. Another important hormone produced by the embryo is beta-HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. This hormone is produced by the placenta at peaks about week 7 as we can see here in this graph and then it falls down. Beta-HCG is produced by the placenta in order to keep the corpus luteum functioning so that the corpus luteum continues to produce estrogen and progesterone. Another hormone called PGF2-alpha or prostaglandins F2-alpha also enhances myometrial contractions and induces luteolysis and also causes the secretion of relaxin. The figure here explains the changes in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis during the pregnant state and the non-pregnant state as we have already discussed in the previous slides. The growth and development of the placenta alters the feedback relationships among the hypothalamus, pituitary and adrenal gland. In this figure, we will be discussing about the potential interactions between the immune system and the process of parturition. Relatively little research has been conducted regarding the interactions between the immune system and parturition in ship. In case of rodents, it is probable that the immune system plays a role in stimulation of the endometrial prostaglandins F2-alpha that causes luteolysis and subsequent progesterone withdrawal. Despite abundant recent research, the role of immune system in human parturition remains unclear. The role of endometrial prostaglandins and the existence of mechanisms underlying a functional progesterone withdrawal requires more clarification. In this figure, we will be discussing about the positive feedback loop of parturition. We can see here that the brain stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. The oxytocin is then carried to the uterus via the bloodstream and it stimulates myometrial contractions and pushes the baby towards the cervix. As the head of the baby pushes against the cervix, this stimulates 
some sensory nerve fibers around the area. These nerve impulses are then transmitted to the brain which in turn stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more of oxytocin. So this is in brief the positive feedback loop of parturition. The figure here shows the factors that are responsible for stimulating myometrial contractions during parturitions as we have already discussed in the previous slides. We can see here that estrogen is responsible for increasing of oxytocin receptors in the myometrium and it also increases oxytocin secretion by the posterior pituitary. This in turn increases the uterine contractions and also increases prostaglandin secretion by the uterus. The prostaglandin secretion increases uterine contractions which also increases the stretch of the uterine wall. This in turn stimulates more of oxytocin secretion by the posterior pituitary and this cycle continues until and unless the uterus contracts and contracts and contracts until the baby is born. So, these are some of the suggested readings and references that I have gone through in preparing this presentation. And you can go through these books which are easily available online to clear all your concepts. So, we have come to the end of this video lecture. For any queries, doubts and feedbacks, please feel free to contact me at my email address that I have been provided here. I express my sincere acknowledgement to the Zoological Society of Assam for giving me this platform. I also thank to all my viewers for your kind attention and I hope that this lecture will be beneficial to you all and wish you all the very best for your future. Thank you.